I'm sitting here with Paul Green, and I met Paul through my meditation retreat this past weekend, and I immediately gravitated towards his way of being, uh, his musicianship, his way of being, who he is as a father, and I wanted to just get it to know him a little bit more. Um, professionally, though, Paul, if you, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about what's exciting in your world, what makes you come alive, I think give you some people a little bit more context, that would be really great. For sure. So professionally, I'm an actor. I've been at it for 20 years um, from a small farm in Canada, and I watched Bloodsport, and I knew I had to... I kept waking up in the movies with Jean-Claude Van Damme, and I was like, all right, this is a problem. Like, I was on this farm doing chores, and I was waking up in movies. So at 16, as soon as I got my license, I put myself in acting school. So I am... And I have always knew I wanted to act from from then, and, and it, I've now, 20 years later, it's a, it's a career that I do every day. I'm on a TV show called When Calls the Heart that, that's um, in our season six right now. And we also, it's on Netflix. Um, my character comes in in season four. I love music. Um, I play piano, guitar, and I like to sing. My, I, and I also am a pilot. I love uh, flying. My dad got, there's 14 pilots in my family. Oh, wow. So I, I grew up around birds, those kind of birds. Um, I'm a I'm very curious uh, spiritual person. I'm very, very um, in love with my life. I'm a father. I have a beautiful partner named Kate. And um, I'm passionate about helping find a cure for ALS. My dad died from ALS a few years ago. So that's something I'm very passionate about. And just having my life... Um, make a difference for others is is what I'm creating my life as. Mm, beautiful. And then the, the theme of, from what I gather from our conversation, the theme of our conversation, we primarily talked about how do we go from fear to love. And that's what we cover. That's right. And yeah. that fear to love is, is the album that I'm writing. I'm working on an album. And that's going to be the journey of the album. And that's... I did a, a documentary in the Himalayas called The Highest Pass, and that was where that was birthed. We were on motorbikes for a month in India to Tibet, and I was a part of a documentary, and I had my son on the gas tank, his pitcher there, because I was constantly afraid of being maimed and hit by trucks, and we saw so many people get hurt and mm. killed. Mm. And I was in fear, and I was not a very good rider. And at one point, I just I felt God just say, fear makes you dumb and stiff and a bad rider, and love will make you liquid and smooth and a good rider. So I put a picture of my son there. Whenever I felt tension, I just like, all right, let's, let's move to love. And I would see the picture of my son, and it made me a more creative rider on the motorcycle, less rigid and less fearful. Mm. So that's where the fear to love was uh, born. <laughs> was was in the Himalayas in India. What a what a what a lesson! Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk to you today, um, namely because when I first met you in our meditation retreat, <clears throat> I was immediately gravitated to your point of view on life, um, namely because how you spoke about the allure of like having lots of money versus what ultimately matters, spending time with family. That's per your value system. So I'm excited to kind of explore that with you a little bit further. Mm. Um, but before we dive deep in those topics, this is the question I always ask everyone. That is, what are some of the pivotal moments in your life that made you the person, the man that you are today? Hmm. Well, being uh, raised in on a farm really has made a big difference. It was like a working acreage, so we had a lot of different work to do with chores and learning how to work hard as a young young person. And knowing that my weekends didn't really belong to me, they belonged to the farm. Like that was just what we did and, and we didn't and we had it easy. Like we didn't have a lot of animals. We just had big land to take care of. Um, so that was a big 
piece to my life was working with soil and having my bare feet and my hands for my whole childhood in the earth, in the garden, and learning the value of nature and hard work and playing too. We had a full force that my dad built us dojo to to fight each other on and throwing stars. My dad was a welder, so and nunchucks and like, oh no kidding, yeah, wow, and so tre- cool. tree forts and learning how to build them ourselves and learning how to fix our motorcycles mm. ourselves. And um, and then that was a found big foundation. And I think along that the, the religion I grew up in, which was a, a very strict Christianity, like a, but it was the kind of Christianity that was kind of fun, like it was. Pentecostal so people were getting healed and their hands were raised and people would speak in tongues and it was very it was a version of Christianity that was like it seemed to me like the most exciting as a kid because you would just watch the old people in church talk weird and you're like what is going on <laughs> and I was around the music I grew up in music and I wanted to be a drummer so I, got, I practiced with a teacher that taught me rhythm and he was a really great jazz drummer and I was a drummer in a church and I did drama in church and I fell in love with uh, with music and drama but I was so in love with sports that it was it, they were always in opposition to each other they never really worked well together because I be hanging out with the athletes down at the drama door at school they were always smoking and listening to heavy metal so it was like how do I relate to the arts but also love physically moving my body which as a kid I had to like I was climbing everything played every sport hockey baseball basketball volleyball volleyball is what eventually took me to college on a scholarship was Mm. volleyball I just fell in love with it Mm. Um, but pivotal pivotal moments along the way was my relationship to God and and my relationship with my father and Mm. because my dad was an amazing father my dad was gone a lot. He was in the oil and gas industry, so he traveled a lot. But when I had my dad, he was amazing. He's very present and mm. steady. And later in life, I would learn what a what a real man was in terms of holding space for a woman. And my dad did that for my mom. My dad mm. had a deep listening for my mom. And so he, watching my dad... Uh, and how adventurous my dad was because he rode motorcycles and flew airplanes and mm. my dad's the reason that I got into airplanes and motorcycles mm. and that I got my pilot's license really young so that I could connect with my dad and and be with him and so I think that relationship with dad was so such a pivotal pivotal thing and um, I think there was an age when I was seven or eight and I I watched my brother get sexually abused by a babysitter and I think that was one of the biggest moments that kind of set a path of of healing like for you or as a healer as for me as a human being to watch my brother have something happen and not being able to do anything about it Mm -hmm. and being angry about it and not knowing how to express the anger I realized later in life how important that moment was, especially for my brother, but but me not being able to help him, not being able to, because I was younger than him. Mm. That really shaped kind of the sexual journey of my life too, because I became really promiscuous from 15 mm. to 18, like mm. brutally promiscuous, just trying to figure out what to do with that what I witnessed and Mm. parents wouldn't believe us that something happened and Mm. at that that moment of witnessing sexual abuse and not knowing how to help or not knowing how to defend my brother also just stirred up like this kind of inner rage Mm. that I've now as an adult got access to as a tool but also as a as a point of going something is wrong something happened Mm. And I made it mean a bunch of things <laughs> and kind of shaped my life around it as a sexual human being. Mm. And at 18, I met a model who was really beautiful. I mean, that sort of, we're jumping ahead a bit, but like really shifted my path was volleyball scholarship in college. Somebody saw me in a bar, 
said, you should model. And I went to meet the agent. And out, the day after I met the agent, I met a beautiful Christian girl. At the agency? At the agency. Mm. And she was like the real deal. Like she was like, she had a guitar and she had a Bible and she loved Jesus. And she was hot. <laughs> and I was at that point nowhere near a relationship with God even though I grew up in it and had Jesus camps every summer where I got fully on fire for God every summer mm. it would only last about a week mm. in school mm. and this girl Jenny really um, showed me a relationship with God that was attractive mm. that that was actually about a relationship not religion and she that's when I started playing guitar reading the Bible and I became celibate at that mm. moment, at mm. eight, the moment I met her, I was like, if I'm ever going to be with someone like you, I'm going to wait till my wedding night. Mm. So at the same time, I was discovered for modeling. So I quit my volleyball scholarship and mm. quit university or college and traveled the world mm. as, a, as a model. Mm. But born again, like no parties, no drugs, no girls, just my Bible, my guitar and my pilot's license and I had took all that sexual energy and turned it into studying and investing. Like I took my money I made from modeling and bought real estate and rental mm. properties at 19, 20, 21, 22. Had I not been, dis Jesus had, I had not had that commitment to God. Mm. I would have probably done like all my friends did in their twenties and their teens. It's mm. just, drugs girls spend the money um, live blow out your life right. but I had this structure this incredible discipline that came I would love to take credit from it but it was it was something bigger it was a life path like it was I didn't really have much say in it I really felt like my life was I was chosen to dive deep into the mythology of the Bible at the time I didn't have that language around it but like I just was like consumed the Bible like mm. the stories and over and over again and I shared Jesus with everyone mm. like I played my guitar all over the world on trains and buses in every country and gave out little pieces of paper that told people how they could find Jesus like little tracks that were like if you want to know how to get to heaven this mm. is how you get to heaven and I was committed and with no fear like I just had no fear of people turning me down or rejecting it or anything mm. and so it was quite a dichotomy I had one of the m most successful male modeling careers of anybody in terms mm. of income mm. stature the mm. clients I worked with and I credited it all to God because I had a built in tithing system where 10% of my money I gave Mm. to church and to charity Every, mm -hmm. never missed it my dad you till asked, this day pardon till this day till this day never okay. stopped alright so you shit a lot there's so many points I want to follow up <laughs> and I know that it's not over yet but there's so many things I wanted to, to, to ask you so what I hear a few things one is you won the genetic, genetic lottery in some respect, right? You were born into a family where there's a strong male figure, right? Who embodies to you masculine being and what that looks like. You were encouraged to uh, be physical, right? The, the providing the, the environment, the space, the activity, the tree climbing, the ninja stars and all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, you um, were involved in athletics, you were surrounding yourself with, uh, but you also had the um, interesting, I guess, twist would be the word where you experienced your brother's sexual abuse and yeah. then it, you shifted your life in a particular way. And then um, there's a lot of things I can follow up with. So knowing what you know now, what do you think, because you are a father now, right? Yeah. Do you feel like do you bring the similar flavor of um, parenting that your father did, as in in terms of the physical activities, in terms of the all this adventurous, the curiosity that your father instilled in you? And you, do you pass it down to your son as well? Yes, I mean it's 
the my relationship to my son is obviously different because my dad didn't have the communication that I have learned. My mm -hmm. my dad's responsibility was to provide mm -hmm. and to protect. There wasn't the emotional expectation it seemed on my dad to be able to talk about his feelings <laughs> with us, you know, or to ask us really how we're feeling. It didn't never really that it the relationship to my son mm -hmm. is very different than the relationship that I had with my dad. But it does have those aspects that you talked about. There's a lot of adventure, a lot of physical play. My son and I play every day, something, volleyball, basketball. We wrestle, we play darts. We're very active. And, Sounds and like you're really involved in his life. Very. Yeah. And I, have the, I don't really have the luxury of taking him for granted because I have him a week at a time. Mm. His, I separated from his mom mm. uh, 15 years ago. So when he was, well, he was only a year and a half, so 13 and a half years ago. His mom and I separated when Oliver was really, really young. And so I've had him a week at a time mm. for his whole life. One week, one week off. And that week I have him is full on, like mm. very present, very deep connection. And the week I don't, I get a bit of reflection time on what I mm. did with him. Was I present? Did I make him wrong? Mm. Like. So I think a dad who has a kid 24-7, 365 every day, has a harder job than I have because I have the week of space mm. to f focus on my dreams, my goals, what I'm after, and mm. a reflection time of how, how my time is spent with my son. And then when I have him, it's like Christmas time. I'm, mm. It is like 100% game on, like play, fun, mm. dive deep, adventure camping the whole thing mm. so in it's more than a silver lining it is the life that we created for him mm. and that he created called in for himself and he has a really unique life mm. does that almost sound like it's better than the traditional 24 7 i mean i'm sure if you asked him uh -huh. he most kids would have the romantic dream that their parents would be together and I'm not sure if he would say it was better, but I think possibly later on in his life he'll look and go like, look at this diverse. I had two dads because his uh, his dad mm -hmm. um, is also very involved. Mm -hmm. His his stepdad is mm -hmm. also very involved mm -hmm. in, in his life, and he has the perspective of Katie, who's my my love and my partner, who's just like a super coach and like super wise and. Mm -hmm highly intuitive and then his mom which who's just like a rock star in every sense so he has four mentors mm. giving him four unique lenses on how to look at things mm. so i think it's better but i also the 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 family and like you said in this question of what it's like to be a dad in modern times the traditional family I, there's something so strong and so beautiful about that i'm not i'm no way am i assuming that's better to have a broken home or a split home or a shared home but there are some really cool benefits mm. that i've experienced from my own perspective about it yeah. um yeah, I mean, my friends and I, we, we, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, obvious, I am not a parent yet, so this is all, I'm imagining what it's like to, to have a, you know, someone who totally depends on you, right? But to me, as an imperfect human being who is perfectly imperfect, um, it's kind of crazy to me that we expect to, we're expected to um, pass on our ideas, these memes, to the next generation because that's so limited in perspective. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, tribally, we do have this community of elders that you know kids can pick and choose different points of view or so-and-so is an expert in something, right? Trade or like building woodwork or art or martial arts or whatever it may be. And, but these days, they're very, very limited. It's almost as if the more connected we are by technology, the more insulated. And then now the kids are solely dependent on the parents who are living in boxes, basically, on top of one another, those little apartments. Yeah. And I think so, there's such a missing. So when I do have my own children, my desire is to have these 
multiple perspective, whatever may call it. Hopefully not in a share home situation, but in a but in a in a in a tribe of elders where they can listen to. I'm curious to know your thought about that. I I think like so. There's a gentleman named Joseph Campbell um, who who I'm sure you've heard of. The he wrote the Hero's Journey, a hero with a thousand faces, and he's the the biggest mythologist that we have who passed away. Um, he's responsible for the Matrix and for Star Wars and, you know, even um, the the hero's journey, the classic hero's journey. And he said that our society began to fall apart when we stopped living in tribes. And because the elders would, your, my grandma and grandpa would take care of the young kid, well, the young couple who are like 18, 17, or 15 year old, they're, they're able to develop their craft and their love for each other. Their full responsibility was never the kids. The elders took care of the kids. And there's something about that that's really, really powerful and mm. really, really incredible. Now, as you said, we're these individuals. But we found tribe again my pers- from my perspective through the Internet. Like mm. the Internet and our s- the way we connect through technology is bringing tribe back around in a way where we have all the tools Mm-hmm. that we would have from elders at our fingertips by mm-hmm. by a quick search we can gain a lot of wisdom not not the same as if it was from our grandparents or our parents in the sense but i feel our desire for tribe is being actualized through technology so you're um, a technology optimist i'm an optimist i i love that through my phone i can absolutely tr- time travel and do anything that i can think of within a split second i think the, the, the dangers are obvious that we stare at the screen like narcissists into the mm-hmm. pond at our own reflection and where we can the tendency is to really lose mm-hmm. everything that's out in front of us mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. the beauty is it's a transformational portal into doing anything you want and it just requires like sugar mm-hmm. or or croissants it requires discipline mm. it requires how do you have it add value to your life and not mm. diminish your life. Mm. That's so important to remember that framework. How do? You, but it's such a easy way also because the ego is tricky, right? You can justify, rationalize anything. You know, yeah, I'm totally. I what would be a good example. Uh, oh, um, I deserve to eat this sugar because I worked so hard all this week. It's yeah. a way to rationalize. I mean, there's some variation of that for anything of, yeah. of our addiction, right? Maybe so. But without getting more philosophical, I, I'm actually curious to know if you wanted to say anything more about your pivotal moments that kind of shape you <laughs> as a man, as a father, as a, as a human being, as an entrepreneur, as a lover, anything that you wanted to share, like pivotal moments that kind of shaped your mm-hmm. worldview. Yeah. Well, going on that path of Christianity, I did wait till my wedding night to have sex six and a half years later. So I was celibate from 18 and changed to 24 and change. Oh, actually, on that note, curious to know your thoughts. Sorry to interrupt. It's, one may say, it's really challenging to navigate the holding that sexual energy. Right. right. So you can go crazy with it, as you said earlier, the promiscuity, right? And then you lose your purpose. But you can also, on the flip side of that, get so controlled by this like absolute no no, right? Mm-hmm. And then, but this energy had nowhere to go. You couldn't really channel it. Then you have the also the kind of like the unhealthy way of expressing that sexual energy. Mm-hmm. Case in point, the Catholic Church, the priests, mm-hmm. all these other things, right? So yep. as a, as a uh, kind of like the dichotomy, the different spectrum. So how were you able to, coming from a very, one end of the spectrum, coming to the middle where you're, sounds like, able to harmonize in a very healthy way for your career, for who you are, for the path that you took on? It was a natural... I understand the question. It it in the there's a lot of repression and there seems like on any extreme of these things there's a lot of dysfunction. Mm-hmm. But I channel the sexual energy into learning and into finances and into music and into learning how to cook and learning how to speak languages and like building this life that was so fun 
that the sexual stuff, it didn't even feel like I was repressing it. I just, I was busy. And yeah, I was, so many other things happening. And sexual energy is creative energy. And mm. it's, it's your, I just turned the tap on in another area. And I mm. think that even now, as a 44-year-old man, I, when I go away from my love, Kate, and I'm in Vancouver, I have to channel that into songwriting and into mm. the gym and into my art and into contributing to other people's lives, not get self-absorbed and and get dangerously addicted to any pornography or masturbation or all of, like it, it's yes it's a it is a discipline but it's not one of lack it's of abundance of finding an abundance of fun things to do that mm. you can channel that energy into mm. that you're not even it's not even the word temptation isn't even in the conversation because that creates a polarity right mm. It's not like abstaining from something. It is just doing everything and that one thing isn't going to make your life better, mm. isn't serving you. So you decide not to add that in for the moment. Nice. It's not gone forever. It's just not going to work with what you're creating in your life at this point point in time and it just takes to remember the perspective I knew I was going to get married I knew I was going to have a wedding night mm -hmm. I knew I was going to have sex again mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't I wouldn't feed the 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 black wolf like I wouldn't stare at a girl's ass as she walked by mm -hmm. like I wasn't looking at pornography I wasn't hanging out with people that were doing drugs and partying I hung out with elders of like giants real estate giants God, music giants, uh, spiritual giants, and I learned. Mm. Aviation gurus, like I just, I got so much out of not running my sexual chi all over the planet for the, those pivotal years. Some would look at it as rep repression, but I never saw it that way. I still don't see it that way. Mm. I see it as just like a training for martial arts it was just a it's little a discipline yeah and then what I hear you saying between the lines and, and also in words too explicitly is that your life is just so full it wasn't a missing if you didn't have this aspect of your life there's so many other avenues for you to continue to grow and then enrich your life in real estate in, in, in acting in, in, sorry, in, in modeling and mm -hmm. all these other ventures that you can spirituality that you can take on such that missing this aspect is not something that you would need to obsess over. No. Like you need to kind of hide and then repress by like having this like very rigid control. No, because that's an addiction. Right. That becomes the brain. It probably hits the exact same part of your brain and it's like, ooh, yummy. I get a new thing to be an addict over, which is the abstinence of that thing. Mm. Like it's still checking the same boxes up there with your dopamine, serotonin, all that because you're getting some kind of a payoff which mm. is I'm this disciplined, controlled, uh, amazing human. I never, I didn't have time to observe myself and go, oh, look at I'm abstaining from sex. I was just having fun. Mm. And I was l in love with learning. Mm. And that's a little bit who I am. Like I've always been a little like that. I've really enjoyed new things and, and taking on new things and learning. Did you need to cultivate that curiosity or just naturally you're always this curious and you didn't need any kind of cultivation? Just, you just like following, like pulling that thread of curiosity wherever you go. Yeah, I was very curious. I needed discipline. <laughs> I only needed discipline. I needed a structure to the chaos. I had plenty of chaos as a kid. Like if I, I was always jumping off of buildings like I had that kind of energy like and you literally jump literally jumping I would look for the highest thing and go and jump off of it I never <laughs> broke a bone I'm built like a Viking I'm 220 pounds and even as like a kid my 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 I'm Norwegian and Dutch and and my bones were I never broke a bone but I, I have no idea how because of the you know, when I see the things we jumped off of as kids, I'm like, how did I jump off of the barn? It was it's like 30 feet high. <laughs> but it's, uh, I needed structure to the chaos. And I always got in trouble when I was the, a really challenging uh, young person. But God, when I found God at that time, it gave me 
that structure and it gave me the channel for all that sexual energy to be put to some good use and to and I was doing good for others too it wasn't just about me and so say more about that structure like so tactically in terms of discipline in terms of tactical like structure how did Christianity Bible this church that you go to provide that for you principles you know studying that's why I was digging through the Bible looking for examples of people that failed miserably like but also loved God like King David was one of those in the Bible that God he was after God's heart yet the guy went after Bathsheba had Bathsheba's wife killed he like had he made more mistakes than anybody's heart was right for God so I I think that's why I read the Bible so much because I was looking for these stories and these these examples of of how to live life in a way and, 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 you know, the principles that the Bible put forward, I just kind of absorbed them through, through mythology mm. and through stories. And I surrounded myself with really powerful men. Mm. Like, what makes them powerful? Their ability to share their tools with me and their way to communicate how they got what they got. For example, my friend Steve Foote, who his family owns a bank mm. in Manhattan and in Pennsylvania, like, and it's a family thing. Mm. And he had like eight kids and, I was, and their, his kids were impeccable. Like I was like, and I went to him and I said, why are your kids like this? Like they're so fun to be around. You, you say X and they do X, but they're not afraid of you. They love you. And he goes, here, read this book. And it was called Baby Wise. And Baby Wise is just like a parent-directed style of parenting that's pretty controversial and and also incredibly amazing. And he shared that book with me. And I've given that book to like probably 30 men in my life mm. who are about to have a baby. Mm. And, and the things like that. So the men that I've chosen, Michael Guido, along my life, he was the, one of the, a youth pastor that traveled with rock musicians. And I've just, I've really surrounded myself with, titans like men that had a lot of integrity mm. and that's what made them power you, so let's get tactical right so for anyone that's listening how would you recommend what are some indicators for integrity of integrity because everyone would say yeah i have integrity right i don't i don't think i've met anyone who's like ah, i don't know about integrity like right, everyone right. Was saying, yeah, right. i have integrity but the variation of embodiments, very, you know, is different. So, like, how how do you tell when someone has integrity or versus not? <laughs> Where they do what they say they're going to do. Like mm-hmm. they say something, and that then they they do that thing. You, they very rarely. And I was trained with my son. When I say no, I don't change my mind. Now that he's older, I'm open more for inquiry. And if he's like, Dad, I don't understand why you said no, then I'll be like, well, let's go into that. And if his argument is strong enough, I'll change my mind. But now that he's older, but when he was young, no meant no and yes meant yes. Mm-hmm. And I think the... You int- gave him that structure. I gave him the structure. The parameter. I gave it's him... Not movable. I was never counting to three going one, two, three. On the count of three, it was like, Oliver, let's go. And if he didn't, I would go over, get down on my knee and look him right in the eye. And I'd be like, you hear me, right? I'm talking to you, right? Mm. And he's like, yeah. And I would get down on his level and I would never bully him with fear. Mm. Uh, Oliver had tons of structure, my son, Mm. but it was guided by love, not fear. Mm. And that's the difference. I was raised with a little bit of fear. And the religion was a little bit of fear mm-hmm. of going to burn in hell forever if you don't right. accept Jesus as your savior. Like that's, and my, if I could sum up my entire pivotal, pivotal moment in my life was the journey from fear to love, mm. having my life be governed by fear and then governed by love. And, and I've taken that into my parenting and that's, that is what I look for in the mentors I've chosen as well. If they have a lot of integrity, but they're living their life as terrorists, like tormenting the people around them with their fear, they're not, it's not just integrity I look for mm. in my friends or in myself as an attribute. It's love. And it's, it's loving in a, in a way that my teacher, Kathy, who's taught me everything, she, when Oliver was really young, 
she we were camping in Big Sur and she noticed a way that Oliver was reacting to me and she goes you know he's only obeying you because of fear this is what she said to me my son was about four at the time I was like what are you talking about she's like he's he's afraid of you and she goes when has he ever come up to you and just like snuggled and she goes you have a tapping foot you're restless and you're angry and he is afraid of you and this was at four and thank god my teacher came into my life when she did this is kathy and so she goes get really present paul take a deep breath and we were around the fire in big sur and ground yourself stop tapping your foot and get present and oliver was running around like and his behavior was crazy and she and and she goes instead of trying to bully him with your energy Get down on one knee and share with him. The way you're acting, Oliver, doesn't work around the fire where we are. We want you to be here and we love you. But if you're going to act crazy like that, you got to go in the tent, zip it up and go nuts. Created structure to the chaos. She taught me that all in the same moment. So Oliver went in the tent and he just went nuts in the tent. And he loved it. He was like a wild animal in the tent, <laughs> which didn't work where we are. It's right. dangerous with the fire. Yeah, we were trying to have a good conversation and he was crazy. But I was able, because of her getting present, then and I was like, Oliver, are you ready to come out of the tent? And he's like, not yet. <laughs> and he went nuts a little bit longer and then he gassed himself out. He comes out. He came over and for the first time, I think in his life, he came, laid his head right on my lap. Mm. and I'm looking at the fire and it was almost sun setting and, and Kathy's there and, the, and, and I just, I'll never forget mm. the moment I learned to connect with my son in a way where he's not afraid of me, mm. where it's coming from love. I'm so moved by what you shared. Thank you so much. That was a very special moment. Thank you for, so much for sharing with me, for the people that are listening to this. Um, I don't know if you speak text, but that's the only way I text. No, I'm okay. I don't know how to do it. You just push the the you push this button here. Uh, hey, buddy. How's everything going? Question mark. I see. I love it. It frees my. Frees, frees, I I can't stand doing that. Yeah. It's a way of having technology not own you you get to own it a little bit that's how i feel i feel like when i'm typing in my cell phone with my thumbs that my technology is owning me mm. and when i speak it i feel like i'm owning it mm. it's an interesting thing because i'm able to be a little bit more present too mm. with the, my surroundings i love it thank you for sharing that yeah i got that own concept from aubrey marcus book own the day own your life mm. have you read it mm -hmm. there's a few things in that book that i was like oh that's i'm gonna borrow that at least that concept of owning your day mm. not letting your day own you or don't borrow from tomorrow by drinking heavy tonight if you do you're not owning the day you're having your your alcohol's owning you mm. um another structure to the chaos you know i'm always looking for that i'm always looking for an order to the chaos like mm. How do i add a container so that my creative feminine side can be playful but I can still highly function as a responsible man and be enough of a structure that my woman can have the feminine space to be playful and fully expressed or angry and not be reactive to it. That I can be in container for my woman mm. in the same way. And another book is David Data is the way of the superior man. Mm. Beautiful book. Fortunately, 12 years ago, that book came to me and it's kind of been my Bible through Mm. my my this my 30s mm. of I'd read a chapter a day and I'd mm. integrate it and then I would um, and I worked with David uh, David Dado was one of his assistants oh, no kidding uh -huh. oh amazing in Miami um, so I got to be one of the male assistants and got some coaching through him and I'm there's a lot of things that I really really love about David's work there's some things I disagree with but that's that's what having a, an objective, sane mind is, is questioning. And so I don't never take, I don't take anything without questioning it a little bit. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. That's actually a really key, uh, it's to have curiosity at the same time, not to be buying everything wholesale. Right. Whatever it may be, any mentors, any kind of ideas. I always, I think, 
I can't remember who said this, but I think it's like God's will or something like that, where God wants you to question everything because mm-hmm. that's within your. That's what consciousness is. Because yeah. otherwise, we'll just be automatons, you know, just doing you know robotic work, following and everything. So. Yeah, I agree. And then there's I have, there's a limit to questioning too, where you become in resistance to everything, right? You. Mm-hmm. It's a, such a fine balance. Questioning to a point that you, only that it's make serving your life and making your life work if you become a, a, a very resistant questioning person to a point where your life doesn't work then you've taken that too far yeah and you can be in resistance or in creation right yeah and which is a distinction that i love from the work that i'm currently doing and um in that to i think being curious like you said is a is maybe a more powerful way to describe questioning everything Mm -hmm. because questioning everything has quite a bit of resistance and resistance only gets you so far yeah i love the yin the older i get the 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 more i appreciate the yin yang sign to me everything is a spectrum like it's everything to everything is a spectrum and the idea is to find a harmonious point it's not a balance point because balance implies giving up something and then letting something else go right whereas harmony it's have everything work and then in, mm-hmm. in the black there's a little bit of white in the white there's a little bit of black you know so everything to me is the key point is to find that internal compass internal harmonious point but you actually drop a few gems i want to go back to this real quick in terms of and this is all in the overall journey of going from fear to love in terms of holding space for your woman for your son say can you say a little bit more about the work that you actually take whether it be from reading whether it be from studying with you know master teachers like David Data as an example how do you how do you embody that how do you integrate that because it's easy to read oh I understand it therefore I am it that's not how it works, right? It's the integration work is so much more important. Can you sp- say a little bit more about that? It's a challenge because especially how the stars aligned when I was born, I'm a Gemini, which means I'm outrageously curious and I just try everything. So for me, discipline, take it, it is a challenge to stay with one discipline for to master it. Like I have to... F- find a way to make it fun because Mm. fun is kind of the flag that that floats my ship Mm. like that is what moves my ship is fun and if it isn't fun i won't stay with it so whether it comes practicing the guitar meditation exercise cooking like any discipline that i try to master and get really really good at if it's not fun i won't stay with it so i a part of me making something becoming a master so to speak or becoming talented at something i have to find a way to make it fun how do you do that because i want to do that i hear you yeah because i'm the kind of guy who i see the goal i'm going after it yeah. but i start to lose this like you know i don't know how to say it, like draw mm-hmm. to be right this genesis choir like this yeah. like this like joy to and it becomes like a chore and then it becomes like burdensome and then so when I meet people who's alive and enjoy and mm-hmm. joyous and it's like, okay, I want to know, so how do you do it? How do I make things fun? A big part of it is who I am from birth. I mean, I was the guy that would, would just, everything had to be fun for me to learn. I had to have it fun. As an adult, how I keep things fun is I, I have a lot of variety, so I don't, for me, if I just studied, say, Junkido, like one type of martial arts or Kale Eskrima, I wouldn't, I would get bored so quickly. I have to find a type of martial arts that allows me to do it all. Mm-hmm. And then I go, go, go. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to set that aside for a bit. And then I'm going to play with that. I am not the kind of person that will probably be 20 years in one discipline. I'm just not. Mm-hmm. And I know that about myself. And mm-hmm. I accept that about myself. And I even love that about myself. Mm-hmm. I still know that discipline is equals freedom Mm -hmm. in the sense that the more structure and as I get older it gets easier Mm -hmm. as I get older I I'm learning to 
be and do what I say I'm going to be and do more. Meaning, I say I'm going to do something and I do it. As and I and I've, but it, but it's been training. Like I'm I'm in landmark training now, which is a adult education sort of like a, a tool for. I call it like a blind spot. It helps me find the areas of my life that I didn't know that I didn't know. And so I'm always, and, th- and I'm diving deep into this current work where I have a lot of accountabilities and I'm responsible for a lot of people. And, but I still have to find a way to make it enjoyable. Mm. And I think a way to make it fun is to measure it, meaning putting things in existence in my calendar so I know when I'm winning or like keeping a journal so I can like have a little bit of an, 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 an observance of it, not be so engulfed in it that I lose perspective on that I'm having and am I enjoying it? And I think just bringing the distinction, is it fun around keeping that question around? Am I having fun? Mm. Not just me, like the people around you have to be having fun. Mm. It's a way of being that you bring to, you know, to everyone that you touch. Yeah, and it's and making sure other people are having fun before you is an access to this way of having fun. It's not just about me having fun. It's the environment around me. Are people experiencing aliveness, aliveness mm. and play? Are they experiencing um, accomplishment, mm. not, you know, and joy? And and so that's it's it's a great measure to know you're doing it. Are the people around you enjoying being around you? Because I, I used to have fun at, and then other people weren't having fun. Like mm. as a kid, mm. my teachers weren't enjoying how much fun I was having in school. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You were, caught, you were the troublemaker. That, you know, I was. That was the rock, that causes ruckus in the classroom. Or something I, like I really was until, <laughs> until one coach saw who I was. Mm. Larry Ethier, God rest his soul, he just passed a year ago. And sometimes it only takes one. Mm. And he was my one. Mm. He saw me for more than all the other teachers saw me. And he took me aside and he said, if I see your car parked at Donnie Wheel's house, you're not starting on my volleyball team. He was my coach. And he was the vice principal in my school. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to play volleyball. I'm not going to go hang out at Donnie's where there was all kinds of dangerous things going on. And he knew it. Mm. But he... I'm very aware that I may be that one for some kid or for someone, for another adult or a friend. And sometimes it just takes that one person to just really believe in you. And he did change the whole course of my entire life was this one coach. And until even 10 years later, I was having a hard time, sorry, 10 years ago when my son was two years old and he was bullying someone at school, not two, he was in grade I think he was in kindergarten and I didn't know what to do. So I called Larry, my coach. Mm. And I said, this is what's happening with my behavior with Oliver at school is he's kind of bullying and he's, and he's frustrated and, and, and he was probably feeling the divorce. Like he was probably feeling the pull. I don't, who knows? And Larry said, well, let me tell you a story. I, w- I, I was brought to Kenya cause he was a, he's a principal of international schools. And he said, they asked me to be a shepherd over the school for one year, but they said, don't change anything in the school. And he's like, no rules, no principles, nothing. Just take, watch the school for a year. And he's like, okay. But he got there and kids were being expelled and people were being suspended and every kids were being made wrong and the grades were terrible. And Larry's like, nope, I know I said that, but I have to change one thing. And he invoked a principle that where all the kids had to come up with their own consequences when they made a mistake. Mm. So he gave the kids the responsibility to take full responsibility for their actions. And he turned that school around in three months. There was no suspensions, no expulsions. The GPA shot right up. And in one year, he transformed every one of those 150 kids' lives wow. through that one thing. Amazing. They, they, he took away their resistance, the rebellion. And he said, you are responsible for your actions and you have to come up with your own solution, your consequence for your actions. So I, he didn't tell me what to do with my son. He just told me that story. And he goes, try it. If it works for you, it'll work for you. If not, there's a good story. He's just a beautiful human being. He taught me how to play volleyball as well. So I took that to my son. And right up, even that young, in kindergarten, grade one, I said, Oliver that didn't work what you're doing Mm. let's put into place 
your own solution, your own consequence. And he was young not to understand those words. And even at that age, his consequence was so much harder. He's like, going to bed without supper and no <sighs> skateboarding and you can take away my Legos. And I'm like, oh man, like he, his consequences are way harder than mine. I was like, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. And he's like, okay. And, and, and he got so much pleasure and joy out of coming up with his own mm. solution mm. For, to, to, for the thing that wasn't working that he didn't really want to be bullying. He didn't, but he didn't know how to, to create the answer. And through this, through this discovery, through Larry, I learned that tool. Mm. And to this day, at 15 years old, if, he, if something's not working in his life, I'm like, okay, you get to come up with the way to solve this problem, your own consequence for yourself. And it works like a charm. It inspires him. It inspires him to be a better human being and mm. to, to, to be the kind of person where life works for everyone around him. Mm. And it makes him responsible for his actions. I love that. That's like that way of being is you're speaking to um, like your coach or your, your son. You're speaking to them as if they're someone who, with full sovereignty of who they are and that's a higher state that i don't care who you are everyone wants to be to to be that right to be responsible for one's action to be rewarding as such to also have the same consequence versus mm -hmm. an external force imposing punishment or consequences or whatever it may be that what you resist persists and the natural reaction yeah. would be like f you for trying to tell me how to live my life but in this case they actually um, come up with their own consequences it's yeah. a beautiful beautiful way to to elicit that sovereignty mm -hmm. um, it teaches him discipline yeah. teaches him to create his their own order to his own chaos a little bit it gives him the tools and then mm -hmm. just makes him into a, a, a highly functioning uh, part of humanity where he's adding value he's not taking away value and making life miserable and my experience of parenting him has been so joyful mm. and so pleasure like he it's just been and i've definitely along the way been given these huge nuggets of of these tools that i'm like i'm that have made parenting and being a father just just a discovery and so joyful mm. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks for sharing. It actually inspired me to consider like, hmm, how what kind of father would I be when I, <laughs> when I have my uh, one of my own? Thank you. Because for me, not having a child, not having children, the, it's like concerns. Like I don't want to um, be irresponsible with this, irres this this responsibility. But through your lens, you show me a different way of like the come from place. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, this is a different place that you can come from. It's a joyful discovery process for all parties involved versus this responsibility, like heaviness like that comes with it. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, and to not make him wrong, and that's a distinction I've learned lately, the wording of it, to, to take away the guilt and the shame from from him is such a gift and it allows them to really enjoy life when they're not made wrong for their mistakes and to not be coming from fear or guilt or shame or blame but to actually be coming from a place that is loving and not making them wrong for their actions is just it, it could transform the whole planet I feel so on that note let me ask you this question so one of the um, it epiphany that I have during our meditation retreat is is this we have effectively the the ego and then we have the higher self in my mind this this is my mental model and it's easy to follow the animalistic desire to be selfish to care about the self to worry about survival to have anxiousness or to to follow anger all these other things right it, it takes no effort right to do that it takes, to me, effort to choose to be compassionate, to choose to be forgiving, to choose to be generous, to choose to be loving, all these other things. So 
the journey of going from fear to love, this is my personal journey. I feel like having these realizations, epiphany and, and awareness allow me to see, to, to broaden that space between stimulus and response and then to have options to pick. I don't have to default to this reaction, default to this animalistic instinct to be selfish, to do all, do all these things. But nonetheless, it's still difficult. Even though I see the options, I don't always choose the right. higher path. Right. But it seems to me, based on the way you speak, it's, it's effortless. So, can you say a little bit more about that? Is it, is it as simple as you, from the outside perspective, make it seem? Because you have that space, you are now aware of the yeah. options that you have. Yeah. And is it as easy, as effortless as it, I perceive from the outsider's point of view, mm -hmm. to pick the higher path? Or right. is it always, it's actually a conscious, effortful choice? Yeah, I understand, I understand what you're saying. And, and it is as easy or as hard as it is to go to the gym and train your muscles. Meaning, at first, it's dreadful. <laughs> and and it's and it feels like a lot of effort and a lot of conscious thought and a lot of this but you start to feel so good from going to the gym that after a while or training or yoga or martial arts or whatever at first learning to to be really conscious with your kid and raise them in a way that is from love and not fear and is is a challenge but the it's harder for me to be angry, fearful, the and, and the animal, that, that other side that you're talking about, because the payoff of that is violent. And it's the feeling from being angry or frustrated or impatient or judgmental. The 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 I don't think that's easy at all. That might be might be a little bit more like you said, instinctual in some way, but the easy is like where life works. Like mm. like the the my first thought was the gym. Once you start master, once you start going to the gym, it becomes enjoyable, and then you're like, "How did I ever not do this?" Mm. And and it's, and it's a pretty once you see the results mm. from parenting or from the gym, mm. the momentum s starts to make it feel a little bit more effortless mm. than effort. It's not a constant effort. It's a constant awareness, mm. and when a trigger comes up, where I'm triggered. It's just a, about learning what, what as an access to what's triggering me and why it's triggering me. But I don't, it, I don't feel it's hard. Mm. But it, but it's like you watch somebody with martial arts who's been training for ten years; they make it look really effortless, That's right? Or somebody who can play guitar for just with flow, you're like, oh, that's so easy. But no, they they've they've put in the work, and now it's effortless. So I think the same goes for any any habit that you're trying to transform mm. or any practice it takes work but it's it's um it's worth it man <laughs> it is worth it to, mm. especially when your measure or your barometer is having an enjoyable fun life that works like it's harder for me to have a life that has chaos and anger and and unforgiveness or resent all of that feels to me way harder mm. than the effort it takes to cultivate love and opening my heart when my heart feels like closing like that is hard work right like mm. the tendency when you're hurt or somebody does you wrong is to tighten your chest and close right, right. defend defend right. it take it's the hardest thing to do is to open when you feel like closing mm. but it doesn't take too long before you, the payoff for opening your heart is right there and the reward is right there. Mm. It You feel good pretty quick. Mm. Closing your heart and protecting and shutting down feels awful. Mm. It's so it's, it's just, I guess it just depends on the angle that you're looking at it from of whether it's hard or it's easy compared to what mm. it's, it's hard a little bit, but it's, but it's a lot harder to, to, to be in pain. So what I hear is this like short term payoff. There it is. Right. To be to be, follow that animalistic instinct. Short term payoff is fast. Like you don't need to feel the pain or whatever. 
but long term you pay <laughs> long term resentment anger whatever it may be and then the other way around short term open your heart takes a little bit more effort to be forgiving yeah but long term payoff you get that peace of mind you yeah. have that inner peace stillness right and the lie loving. the lie is that life should be easy mm. life isn't it's not meant to be easy like easy life life we're, you don't build muscle by by not like tearing apart the muscle like you you don't like the people feel we all including myself get, forget that life's like easy is not the goal like mm. having so what is the goal i think the goal is joy mm. and enjoyment and and fun like i think the goal <laughs> i think the goal is to enjoy even the no matter what your, con your your circumstances are whether they're favorable or unfavorable you find a way to allow it i think the goal is allowing mm. allowing if my son comes in in a bad mood if i can find a way to allow his bad mood it takes away that resistance so i i yeah, we're covering a lot of topics, but for me, um, I, I find that with, especially in parenting, it, it, it's, there's so much pleasure that I've found in parenting that it's worth the, the short-term, quote-unquote, um, hard work of not doing just what comes easy, you know? Like, um, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So... Let's get a little bit more tactical. I want people to kind of emulate, like let's say they're inspired by your story, by your, inspired by your worldview, inspired by how you show up as a man, how you show up as a leader, how you show up as a, as a parent, how you show up as a, as a musician. What are some of the tactical things that they can try on? You mentioned a few books. Are there other disciplines that you have that will allow them to access the centeredness? So they can be their full self. Yeah, I I feel having a morning practice of, of some kind is crucial. That that you stay away from your technology in the morning. Whether you go for a walk right away, or you have a meditation right away, or you do a, your own yoga, something that you just start the day where you're really committed to yourself and your body and and or journaling and i think a morning practice that you start to cultivate that turns into a into a tradition is really important it's like an anchor for your day and whether that involves coffee there's something that you do that that helps anchor yourself into going okay i've arrived and just I'm putting my stake in the ground and i'm a stand for this right now and it can change over time but you absolutely have to find a practice of some kind. So what are your practice? What I have is your practice? meditation. Okay. So Vipassana meditation is um, Vipassana meditation is where, where you go away and do 10 days. I did mine in Joshua Tree and I learned a, a type of a meditation from there where you move energy around and that's a long one. Mine, mine that I do is, is, is around 15 or 20 minutes and there's a there's a foundation training I do, which is for my back through Dr. Eric Goodman, which is pretty much every day I do a form of it. That is for he works with Laird Hamilton, the big mm. wave surfer, and a lot of triathletes. Lance Armstrong and a few a bunch of triathletes, and it's uh, it trains your entire posterior chain, and that's about 11 minutes, and that's a series of movements that's to turn on your glutes and to turn on your mid back and your mm. and to bring your so if you just look for foundation found the foundation training dr goodman it's one of my favorite all right you feel yeah. so good and it's one of those things at the end of the video it's 11 minutes the video you have to start with the shorter one so start with the three and a half minute one for about a week or two before you do the 11 minute one because you'll burn out too quick you have to and it's online if you just and and i recommend his programs and everything he's an amazing teacher uh, eric goodman foundation training um for for prioritizing your your posterior chain and your spine like to keep you in and it takes and at the end of the video he says do this every day no back pain ever mm. and it's just 
amazing. Anyway, that's something I do very, very consistently. My own yoga, where I do a series of sun salutations and I hold down dog forever and because I have tight or hips and hamstrings and mm. and I'm always working to get my hips open and my uh, my hamstrings looser so my own yoga flow depends where I am too in Vancouver I have a different routine because I don't have any responsibilities I film a TV series mm. every year for about four months and when I'm alone there then I like then it, it's kind of like I, I, I do go for a walk right away or I go to the gym or I like I find some way um, to to put myself uh, as a priority first mm. um, and 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 over the years it, it it's changed like I never meditation has 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 become one of those things that I there's some Wim Hof breathing techniques are you familiar with Wim Hof mm -hmm. yeah that when I go to Topanga to be with my buddy Johan, we do these three rounds of like 70 breaths and we're then we start our meditation. That's a 40 minute meditation. That's a we did that yesterday and that was something else, man. Um, if you Wim Hof is another teacher, I did a, a course with him. I brought him here and um, we had these brought my bathtub to Topanga. We filled it with ice and this was before he became really well known. My friend Rich, who you met, Rich brought Wim Hof mm. in and we had a weekend with him. It was, oh, it was wow. super so cool. cool. Yeah. Personalized. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Before he was already the ice man, but it's before he became, you know, who he's become. Um, I have that, that's, it just depends really where I'm at in the world too. The meditations is very, very important. And when I'm not meditating, I feel it really, really quickly mm. because I go into doing and not being. So looking for practices that that ground me in my beingness, because we're in a world of just doing. Like I gotta do that. I gotta do that, and it becomes this endless spin of of doing, doing, doing. That doesn't bring a lot of accomplishment, and I find beingness can bring a lot of accomplishment. Say you, more about that, actually. Yeah. yeah. So doing, like doing, and it it can easily be related to being a father too. Like you can do the role of a father, right? And and but when you're being a father is a different thing. It's a distinction of of doing this is is for me comes from a place where your identity is at stake. Meaning, if I'm not busy, do 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 do, then I'm not seen as a very um, productive human being. Mm -hmm. Where beingness has a lot of stillness in it, but it also is your 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 what's me giving you the measurement of your success is who you're being, not what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Someone who's being a certain way will just naturally do certain things, but someone who's out doing a bunch of things, it doesn't really work in the reverse. There, there, it's you don't do. Let, let let me let me try to explain. So. If I am running around trying to do a bunch of things for my son, like to, to do like the role of dad, like take him to the park and take him to skateboarding and take him and make him a, you know, make him a great dinner, or to take him to the beach and like do, doing all these things, but I'm not being present, like not being actually with him. I'm just thinking that doing all those things is going to make me something. It's almost it's backwards. It's it's the beingness, and then the doingness, and then you get to have it. It's it's almost like we have it backwards, where we wake up, and we're what where what do we have to do? And we get so busy that we get so stressed out. And I feel like when you're operating from a place of being, like being, it takes away a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the stress and and there's a so much more ac accomplishment and joy that comes from and that could just be simply that taking the 10 minutes to meditate or 15 minutes to slow down and look at your hands and just actually be in this body for a minute we we are we, we're so driven to accomplish and to do things that we forget who we are sometimes <laughs> And we get so defined by the things that we do that we actually don't get to create who we want to be or who we are being. Mm. And with as being a father, the stakes are really high mm. because 
you know, you, you, there's a lot of dads that probably do a lot of great things for their kids, but they never really, really are there being with their kids. Mm-hmm. Like last night, my son was having a hard time for vo- with volleyball practice. And I just came in here and I just laid down next to him and put my hand up and he kind of put his hand into my hand and I, 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 he just needed me to be there with him, not to try and philosophically solve all his problems. And he, and then I was getting up to go and he's like, can you just stay for an, one more minute? And he's 15. Like this is, this is the, for me, the greatest accomplishment of my life to have that kind of a relationship with my son. It's beautiful. It's very inspiring. Yeah. Now, we had a conversation in our meditation retreat where you talked about uh, career versus being a father. Can you, I don't know if you remember that conversation. Can you, I would love for you to, if you do, I'd love for you to re, uh, go a little bit more, talk a little bit more. Career, can you exp- I don't remember the context sure. of it. You were saying that what does it all mean when you're handed a million dollars versus being able to spend time with people that you truly love? Yeah. Right. So yeah. if you can speak a little bit more about, because it's, it's as fathers or even just parents in general, it's challenging. Your heart wants to, is, is there for your family, but mm-hmm. then there's also some practical yeah. right, financial constraints or concerns or dream you want, that dream that you have for your family, for your kids. So there's the trade off. Yeah. So then, then how do you make the best choice mm-hmm. where you can be there for your children, for your family, and at the same time still, again, it goes back to that harmony, right? You can mm-hmm. still have that harmonious environment. We have both versus either or. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to figure that one out because yeah. there's the pull of this career. My career is really taking off and, and acting is, I've been working 20 years at acting and now it's happening, but it takes me away. So there I am in Vancouver filming going, wait a minute, I am not there picking my son up from volleyball practice and, and, and that's what life is about. But then I'm going, okay, but this allows me to send him to a good university. This allows... I'm fulfilling on what I, my dreams. And so it's not, um, there's a lot of dads that are away from their kids a lot. And it's like, it is not easy because, I mean, my dad was gone a ton, a ton. He's an oil, he'd be gone for two weeks and then home for a week and then gone for two weeks and then home for a week. And that was my life. Um, I'm looking for a way to, to find um, peace with it and or just create something here in LA where I don't have to be away from my son at all mm. and because I only have three more summers till he's 18 right that's it I mean you get 18 summers with your kid and that's it and that goes fast so being a parent mm. it's um, <laughs> it's it is something man because you will never love like you love a kid your son your daughter you will never you love your parents but not the same way Mm -hmm. your parents if they're acting nuts you'd be like i need a break from right you know like let's just i'll catch you later for a bit thank you for you know your kid you're just like there's your heart it's you it is you like it is actually physically you there and it would you can't i mean some parents obviously do treat their children in ways that they were probably treated or that they treat themselves like with abuse. It's amazing how that gets passed down. But in for when I look at my son, he's me in a lot of ways. Mm. And looking back at me, and I get another chance at nurturing that inner child. And that's the biggest gift that they don't tell you what having a kid is, is you get another shot at nurturing your inner child. Mm. And I'm fiercely after that, that with him where I I'm not going to destroy his inner child Mm. because I get another shot at nurturing my inner child by just having a kid. It's so incredible. Mm. It's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that mental model. Yeah. Mm. What about tactical things around formulating a community, formulating a council of men or whichever? that really supports your life what um, tactical advice 
or even ideas can you give to the listeners such that they can have this very strong, as you said, mentors or teachers or brothers or, you know, that they can call upon when they need to solve their, you know, life circumstances. Well, you, what's very helpful is just look at the people you're surrounded with and you are the average of the five people you spend time with. Financially, relationship-wise, uh, career-wise, spiritually, you are, will be the average of the five people you surround yourself with. So choose wisely. I would, the tactical advice is be really honest with your circle. Like who are you spending time with and who are you being? Like, and instead of just cutting people off from your life, it's like, how do you elevate your, your circle? And knowing that the people you surround yourself with are going to heavily influence who you are, like mm -hmm. in the best of ways and in the worst of ways for sure. So that's a very tactical way is to take inventory of, of your team, mm -hmm. who you're going through this life with, like who you're journeying with and who's around you. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if it's not making your life better, then it's time to make hard changes. It really is. And it, it's, it means sometimes making really painful choices to probably spend some time alone and get clear through something like Vipassana, which is a little intense, but um, getting to know who you are and then really building your tribe because um, I, in my life has a beautiful way. Like, I don't know if it's tactical, but life has a way of providing what's necessary for you. And these teachers, I didn't tactically go looking for them. They, you didn't? No, my coach saw me for who I was. My, uh, the other coaches, the other people along the way, I saw something in them that I valued and I got curious and I asked them questions. So a tactical, maybe an access would be to be very curious and ask a lot of questions. Um, really, that, that's helped me is to find people that, that I see how their life is working. And I'm like, what are you doing that makes your life seems like it works really really well what is it and then quite often they'll give me a book or they'll give me something like that mm -hmm. but being really really curious i'm constantly reading or listening to audiobooks or listening to podcasts or watching youtube videos i mean when my entertainment is study mm -hmm. that's entertaining like i would i just love learning and i think that if you get really really curious life has a really magical way of providing you what you need Mm, beautiful. Any specific podcast that you should start off? I like Joe Rogan's because I like three hours. Like I love how they dive deep and I like, I'll start at the beginning judging someone and by the end of it, I'm like, oh my goodness, like I, I've, I'm such a dick. Like what, <laughs> like, because, and it just shows me that if you stay with a human being long enough, you can you can discover something beautiful about anyone like and i love that the th i love the longer punk the podcast because i get to totally transform my point of view and and joe rogan seems to have some pretty a lot of the comedians i don't really know them so i don't listen to those but some of his like jordan peterson is is, is a conservative-ish thinker maybe he's in the middle but he's like a he's like a psychologist clinical psychologist that a lot of people don't like and some do like, but when you hear him for three hours, you actually get to know who he is. So Joe Rogan's podcast, I've learned, I've listened to a lot of them. Tim Ferriss's, I've listened to a lot of. Yeah. Um, I've really, I really like Tim Ferriss's. There's like a lot of the ones like um, uh, Radio Lab where they produce that are like, they have actors and they like sound effects and they like, my son and I sometimes listen to Radio Lab in the morning in the car. Um, but then there's like health and fitness people I listen to, like Thomas DeLauer, who has like a ketogenic intermittent fasting. Like intermittent fasting is something that I intermittently do. Mm. <laughs> when I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if the listeners have heard about it, but it probably. And look, intermittent fasting has some incredible longevity and... Um, uh, especially for men, um, bodybuilding, like your muscles when you fast. I sometimes do longer fast too with just water and I found that's a really quick way to get... You just do water? 
I've done, yeah, I did a five day water fast this year, setting up for an eight hour Mongolian um, body work session with Michael Strickland, who's in Vancouver. He's just, it was an eight hour, the most painful body work I've ever had. So two hours. Wait, eight hour body eight, work? Straight. What? So two hours, but we're talking tear the, the ancestral, um, um, armor off of your heart type of work where he's in your mm. chest bone with your elbow and he said that I had this huge armor here that it took him almost four hours to get off and but we're, what we're talking is like deep sternum the deep jaw into the stomach deep but two hours and then I can do a cold shower with a scrub mm. and then I stand in the sun for about five minutes and then I get back on the table for another two hours and it was eight hours total wow. but I had trained with him for uh, about a year prior uh, with two hour sessions, two hour sessions, getting ready for this session. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. Heart, the deepest body work of all, other than my teacher, Kathy. But this is just the another. teacher is also, uh, body Kathy work. is also a body work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Similar type where it's, let's peel off every layer of your resistance until your heart is so open that you can actually feel and see who you really are and who God is without your projection. <laughs> like it's just unbelievable. It is such deep, deep, deep work. And I'm actually really curious if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about that because um, more and more I study like what it means to be a human being. I used to be just a, a my body was just a stick holding up my head. That's it. <laughs> I, I was a walking head. Right. Then I discovered my body. It's like, oh, okay. So there is actually a huge transference, right? The body and the mind and the, in our heart and everything is, is an integrated system. It's not just one thing. Yeah. So if you want to have an optimal lifestyle, optimal human being, I need to focus on the whole freaking thing. Then I discover spirituality. It's like, oh, there's this other thing that I even know about. Yeah. How interesting, fascinating. So the more I s study what it means to be a human being, the more I realize my body is just not functioning as optimally as I would like. Right. Especially ab about the thing, the very thing that you said earlier, accessing the heart. Mm. Right? How do I actually do that in a way? So I'm curious to know, in, with body work like this, what is the effect mm. of, as you said, digging through the armor? Yeah. Right, because I can feel the body tension, so I know what that mm. is like. But I don't know what that's like to 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 not have this tension. I'm curious. Totally. To your my um, my teacher Kathy said to me, "You don't have to die to get to heaven. You just have to learn how to let go." Mm -hmm. And so, in this type of body work, when they're pushing into your muscle, you feel every nerve pain going, and then you find a way to sort of like let go into it. And then it's almost becomes like a portal into another dimension through your muscle, through your trauma, through other, uh, in, in, through layers and layers and layers of pain and, and shame and guilt and punishment that, and it's, it's almost like the, if they're that type of body worker, they can go right through it to a point where you surrender and you completely get to the other side. And there is just an incredible, um, I mean, it takes it takes layers and layers. I mean, it, it is it is like scraping. So mm -hmm. it it takes. It's not something that you can go too quickly because you can create more trauma. Right, because um, you, your body tense up. Like, what is this pain? Yeah, <laughs> it's it, 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 it is. And but like, what going back to the heart? I don't know if you could sum up spirituality any different than opening your heart when it feels like closing. So when someone hurts you, spirituality from my perspective is how do you open when you feel like closing? Like, mm -hmm. and then finding tools to make that a reality. Like the heart, when you're hurt or when someone wrongs you, mm -hmm. the tendency is to protect. So if you're really learning in your spiritual practice, you will be opening when you feel like closing. And I, that type of body work is something that I've attracted or that vibrating foam roller from Viper that I was telling you about. It's called Viper Ice. That thing vibrates so deep that I'll put it there and just kind of like let my body surrender into it until the, the, that, the tightness opens. And it's, um, I don't know. I think that opening our bodies up is, is, a, is, the, is such a, a worthy 
adventure is to not be rigid and stiff that's mm. death that's rigor mortis that's you know you're dead mm. to find things to do that keep you pliable and soft both both in your mm-hmm. structure of your thought mm-hmm. and in your body is is something that I'm really interested in yeah and I'm at 44 I just keep discovering these new tools and then I get really curious and and keep bringing them in and and um keep discovering new ways to open yeah in Chinese medicine the framework is that our body is the vessel for our spirit so when your body is so stiff it becomes brittle it breaks easily right right I don't know if you ever had experience where you hurt your back or you know your, your leg and they just like all you think about is the pain versus if you actually maintain it so it's pliable so it's like you know strong and pliable at the same time then yeah. you can do so much more because then you don't need to worry about because that psychological safety is gone you can do like i can do anything yeah any kind of movement or yeah energize my body myself and through my this vessel that i have so mm-hmm. i'm so curious i love to meet kathy one day <laughs> kathy's amazing michael's amazing there's Michael, a kathy, valerie's yeah. amazing i have a, the, yeah i yeah. guess as we journey through life these like i said before life provides these beautiful teachers and these beautiful and I add value back to their life. That's what I'm. I'm not just trying to get something from them. I'm trying sure. like, how do I, how do I add the value back so that it's um, equally beneficial? And I, I think if that's where you're living your life too, is 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 really adding value. If you want to get paid more money, find a way to add value. Mm-hmm. If you want to have relationships that work, add, make sure you're continuing to add value to others. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I know that we before we start the podcast, you wanted to share some gift with us. Yeah, if and you, if you don't mind sharing, I I don't bless us with your music. <laughs> well, this this isn't this is a song um, that kind of covers the journey that I've been talking about, the old ways. And for me, um, this is from a movie that's out right now, The Stars Born. Um, the this song is about letting the old ways die and what's so interesting about it, the first time I heard it I was like oh that's sad he's letting like old traditions die but then I thought the more I played it and the more I learned it I'm like oh no 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 this is this is like the things that aren't serving you let those die away and and then the, in here is my journey from fear to love for sure in the lyrics and I just this is uh, so this is called Maybe It's Time Maybe it's time to let the old ways die Maybe it's time to let the old ways die takes a lot to change a man and it takes a lot to try maybe it's time to let the old ways die nobody knows what awaits for the dead nobody knows what awaits for the dead some folks just believe in the things they heard and the things they read maybe it's time to let the old ways die i'm glad i can't go back to where i came from i'm glad those days are gone and gone for good If I could take spirits from my past and bring them here You know I would You know I would Nobody speaks to God these days Nobody speaks to God these days I like to think he's looking down and laughing at our ways. Nobody speaks to God these days. When I was a 
child they tried to fool me said a worldly man was lost and hell was real but I've seen hell in Reno this world is one big old Catherine wheel spinning It's time to let the old ways die Maybe it's time to let the old ways die Hell, it takes a lot to change your plans And a train to change your mind Maybe it's time to let the old ways die Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. So good. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that song, it just keeps speaking to me on different. It's not what you like. If you first hear that and it hits you one way, and then I listen to it again, I'm like, ah, oh, like I can let the things in the past that the old ways I let them die at first I looked at it as a bad thing and I'm like no 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 wait <laughs> yeah. I think that uh, any song is like any tool depends on how you use the tool through your voice through who you are through your way of being and really felt the depth of who you are mm. and really felt the depth of who you are as a man who you are as a, as a father who you are as a brother thank you so much for sharing this so generously I want to acknowledge you for just how you show up in this podcast as well like mm -hmm. I really felt the warmth of your character you know the warmth of your being mm -hmm. so thank you yeah, yeah. This, this I learned a lot from this thank you so much me too I mean I want to acknowledge your listening as well you ask the questions in a way and then you're clearing and you're listening for something new to come up that I haven't shared in that way before. So it's a joy to be able to to unpack some of those things. And you brought structure to even some of the chaos, meaning sometimes you just have your way your life works, but when someone starts to ask you questions, you start to define some structure to it as mm. to, oh, I'm like, oh, that's why I do that. And that, mm. so it's actually very insightful, your questions and your listening as well. You discover something new about yourself. I really did. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, for sure. In your listening. And it's if you were a different person across from me, this conversation would have gone incredibly different. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome.